Hi everyone, my name is Shuman Basar. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks also to my guests here on my right who I'll introduce in greater detail soon, uh, Adam Turwell and Jack Self. Uh, if you could please turn your phones to silent right now, I'd appreciate it. Um, any social media posting, we're using hashtag self format. Uh, I also should remind, which, remind you, which I haven't done yet, is uh, there's a really lovely self-format poster in the box over there that Boris Meister has designed for us. Uh, and Jack Self is gonna take a whole load of them and paste them on his be uh, bedroom wall, uh, much to the, the uh, uh, agreement of his wife, I, I'm, I'm told. Um, so let's get, uh, let's get started. Samuel Beckett once said about James Joyce's work in progress that form is content and content is form. A few decades later, um, and Marshall McLuhan declared that the medium is the massage. Inspired by these words, format is about the shapes that knowledge takes, what's the grammar of how we know and feel things, and if there's a hidden politics to presentation, what are they? This is the eighth issue of format, what I call a live magazine. Two, so these are the different formats that we've dealt with over the last uh, several years. Um, but more pertinently, um, in terms of what we're gonna be talking about today, uh, two years ago we looked at the couple format. So what brings working couples together, what sustains them and then also often breaks breaks them apart. Uh, last year, <coughs> we looked at power format, um, and we were asking if power is something that's becoming more or less visible in recent times, and indeed, where is power moving from and towards um, at this point in the 21st century? And, and then this, this issue, uh, of course, we're now dealing with the unit of the self or the self format. So some of the questions that we've been asking uh, again and again, and uh, a kind of running refrain, are that what are the historic sources of the self? Why did Adam Curtis call the 20th century the century of the self? And what has become of the self at this point in the 21st century, where data capitalism is poised as the dominant economic, technological, and political framework for generations to come? So our guests uh, so far have been Sophia Almeria, the Qatari-American writer, filmmaker, uh, Douglas Coupland, uh, the artist and novelist, and hans Ulrich Obris, the, the curator and interviewer. Um, we've touched on the self in relation to artificial intelligence, to physical and digital bodies, to empathy and shaming, to faces, and also, interestingly, to Edward Glissant's concept of mondiality. Um, so as today is going to be uh, another conversation with my two guests, we're going to start by um, uh, uh, having a, a short um, presentation from Jack Self, um, who I've asked to talk about privacy, intimacy, and publicness. Um, some of you may know Jack, so in case those of you who don't, he's an architect based in London. He's uh, the director of the Real Foundation, uh, and they've just published a really amazing book called Mies in London. Um, I'm, no doubt it's at the AA Bookshop, but I really do recommend it. It tells, I think, one of the great kind of mythologies of uh, post-war um, uh, kind of architecture that never happened in, in, here in London, and uh, also tells the story that involves Prince of Wales, Margaret Thatcher, um, and uh, kind of eight, certainly 80s, the onslaught of 80s uh, neoliberal capitalism. Uh, Jack is also the editor-in-chief of The Real Review. In 2016, he curated the British Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennial, and previously he was the contributing editor for Architectural Review and is editor-at-large at the Berlin-based magazine O32C. Um, last but not least, Jack is an alumni here of the AA uh, and an exemplar of the myriad career formats that are possible in this part of the 21st century. Will you please join me in welcoming Jack Self? Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very generous introduction. Um, 
I sort of, I think probably what I want to do is talk more specifically about how ideas of the self and privacy and publicness play out in in practical form in the the uh, somewhat uh, cut short conversation that we might have later. Um, I have to assume that I was selected for this panel on the basis of my name, um, which I should also say, I mean, for me, uh, you know, my name doesn't mean what you think it does. Uh, self is a contraction of Seawolf. It's a Viking name. Um, but I'll come to that in a minute. I mean, th this question of the self is one that's been of great interest to me for a long time. My family motto is by name, by nature. So they tend to be quite egotistic and um, quite self-motivated individuals, often very strong personalities. Uh, and uh, something that I've seen kind of come up more and more on the internet in recent years, uh, which perhaps you've seen also in these sort of motivational um, images with text in them, is this expression, to thine own self be true. Um, and I, that was my first kind of reflection on this idea of the self, how to, how to reflect on this, the prevalence of this idea of being true to yourself. Of course, it comes from Hamlet. Um, it's uh, something that uh, Polonius says to Laertes. Uh, in a sense, I want to suggest that not only is there no such thing as the self, but there is also obviously no such thing as truth, and therefore we should inquire into this idea of whether or not the self is even really a thing. Um, you know, what is the self? Well, there are a couple of qualities to it. Um, one of them is identity. Uh, another might be individuality. Uh, I think agency has quite a lot to do with the self. And I also think the personality has a lot to do with the self. Um, but when we begin to break down these different categories, we see that none of these exist either. It's like a kind of turtle stacked on top of turtles, infinitely supporting the world. It's, it's kind of impossibility. Uh, I mean, let, let's start with identity. You know, identity is, um, is the way that we identify individuals. It's the way we call them out. It's the way we name them. And therefore, part of the self is having a specific or identifiable name, a way of, of locating that person. Um, mostly names are arbitrary, although I'm reminded that uh, Mark, uh, cousins who's in the front uh, uh, row here has a very nice point about forming um, associations over time with arbitrary names. I mean, it is the case that when I was a young teenager, I decided to research the meaning of my name to see if it was something that I identified with. And of course, self is highly specific. It means kind of individual. And Jack is, a, is not a real name. It was invented in the medieval era to mean um, anyone or a any man. Uh, it's the generic form. That's why you have like Jack in in the corner, Jack and the Beanstalk, uh, um, Jack Door, Jackass, these are all generic versions of the thing. And so my name basically means like the generic particular person, uh, which is something that over time I've come to really identify with. But of course, it's, it's arbitrary. It could be any other name. Uh, names and identities are, of course, contextual. Um, Sometimes I identify as British. Uh, I never identify as English. Um, sometimes I identify as Australian or European. Sometimes I'm an atheist. Sometimes I'm a Jew. Uh, some names and identities we choose for ourselves and others are kind of foisted upon us. Uh, and the context of names is very important. Um, uh, the, the name that you might give to a partner uh, or a loved one or a family member will be very different from what they might be called in the office. Uh, the nicknames that we gain in, in the playground are very different from how we would be summoned in court, our kind of legal recognition. Um, of course, speech and, and naming are very closely uh, related. Plato was very hesitant about the invention of writing. In fact, he, he was rather opposed to writing. And one of the reasons that he didn't like writing is because writing allowed you to disconnect the author from the statement. So it invented the concept of anon, or the an anonymous uh, author. Um, and that, in a sense, is a big problem for anyone who's trying to uh, index or control communication. Um, of course, in speech, it's obvious who is speaking. I'm speaking right now. I'm the author of these words. 
in writing that's not properly identified as being associated with a specific individual, you get the problem of not knowing who it is that's making the argument. Uh, and in a sense, the, the issue that we have increasingly today is that in social media and in various forms, we're increasingly pushed to use our real name, quote unquote, real names, um, which forces us into a kind of awkwardness where we're, always for, where we're always presenting the same person to all different contexts. I mean, it's basically the equivalent uh, of having your friends call you Mr. Self. Um, or perhaps the kind of equal problem uh, that you see amongst very famous architects like Rem Koolhaas, in which you have strangers calling him Rem, uh, this kind of false uh, uh, familiarity. Um, and this, this uniformity, having to present ourselves always the same way to everyone with the same name, I think automatically creates a kind of condition of censorship. The, in, the individual is something I've never believed in. Um, I find this to be kind of a really strange argument. Individuality, of course, is, is quite a, a new concept. Um, the idea of the individual has not existed for a very long time. Uh, and of course, the idea, I mean, what does individual mean? You cannot be divided, indivisible in a way. Uh, but how could that possibly be? I mean, where do we get our uh, qualities from that are isolated from other people? Where do we, um, uh, most of our opinions are kind of inherited or copied. Uh, I very much doubt that anyone in this audience could say that they've come to all of their opinions through primary reasoning themselves. So then the question is, well, in order to internalize uh, the opinions of others, in order to evaluate and judge what other people are telling us about the world, um, I believe that we kind of need to have time alone for introspection. There's, there's a real value to privacy in order to form, uh, that we, in order to process kind of knowledge and information, and in order to come to any idea of individuality, because of course the invention of the individual goes hand in hand with the invention of democracy in the 19th century. I mean, this would be my argument for it, because in order to have a democracy, you have to have the idea that every individual has an equal and um, reasoned uh, uh, opinion, uh, but you know how do they how do they form that opinion? Today, uh, we can't uh, process information. We don't have enough time to ourselves in order to properly reflect and to form opinions. Um, the traditional idea of the eight-hour workday, where you go to work and you you do your thing, you punch in at the factory, you punch out, you go home, you join an association, you have a hobby, you play tennis. You, I mean, I don't know what you do with your leisure time. That era is gone. Now we live in a kind of amorphous time in which we're both always working and also never really at leisure, but also always kind of at leisure and never fully committed to the work that we're doing. And this sort of a halfway quantum condition um, makes it impossible for us to have things like hobbies. Uh, and I think, you know, that's a real shame because I value hobbies a lot. But things like Netflix, Instagram, Facebook, these are not passive forms of leisure. They're work for other companies. That I would argue that leisure in itself has largely disappeared from the way in which we live. And as a result, I would also argue that we no longer have real opinions. Um, I think we have now only preferences. At least this is what is often told to us. Uh, and those uh, prefe uh, preferences, I mean, basically what that means is by not having opinions, we no longer hold convictions. What we really do is we make decisions. And the speed of information is accelerating, which means we must make more decisions faster. The hierarchy of decisions has been collapsed so that you make, with the same speed, a decision about what you're going to have for dinner and whether or not you should get married. I mean, these are kind of all, whether or not you should take on 60,000 pounds of student debt and whether or not you're going to take a, a taxi or the tube. These become all kind of given the same hierarchy. Uh, and of course, those preferences that we have, they get bundled together. And the reason they're bundled together into kind of um, stereotypes is in order to more accurately match the criteria of existing algorithms that are trying to make revenue. So we find ourselves actually becoming more homogenous as individuals, I think. Of course, our opinions can change history, but our preferences guarantee that the future will be the same as the present.
Uh, and what about this idea of agency? This is another kind of strange uh, concept uh, that I've never really understood. Uh, to be an agent is to, is to transform the world. It's to have some role in the transformation of reality. And more broadly, uh, agency is an idea of self-determination and, and a, in, in a sense of free will. Um, but, of course, self-determination is bounded by social convention and the repetition of everyday life. Class, race, gender, wealth, place, these basically determine your life. And those of us who believe in inclusivity and equality of opportunity, in merit and social justice, uh, although we're more numerous, uh, we have largely abandoned the field today, I think. I mean, Polonius, in talking to Laertes, uh, also says, um, uh, in addition to, to thine own self be true, he says, give every man thy ear, but few thine voice, uh, which is, you know, listen to what everyone is saying, but don't say anything back. Um, and in a sense, I think that is largely the condition we have now, where everyone is listening, but we're struggling to find a way to properly express uh, ourselves. Uh, and, and then I think lastly, there's a kind of question of personality, which is a very strange word. The extent to which we are a kind of person. Um, well, of course, uh, uh, I'm actually just lifting another point directly from Mark here. Um, or rather, I'm going to paraphrase it to make it better, a better version. Uh, generals have rules of war because they recognize their opponents and they respect their enemy. Um, a person has rights, but of course a thief or a criminal or a deviant has no rights. Um, and therefore they, they are not really people in the sense uh, that there are no rules controlling what power can do to them. Um, the history of the person and the history of the personality, let's say, is of course a history of publicness. Uh, Thomas Hobbes, the, the English philosopher, had an idea of natural personhood and artificial personhood. Our natural personhood is basically what we're doing now. We're real people just having a conversation. Artificial personhood is when you construct a kind of uh, fake person in society like the queen, the president, the prime minister. Someone always occupies that role, but of course it's different people through time. Today we have a weird situation of the kind of rise of a personality who is both an actual person and an artificial person. The example I would give would be something like um, uh, Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt is presumably a real person like us. Maybe we could have a beer together and talk uh, things over. But he's also a kind of public figure, a public persona. And therefore, there is a kind of entity that is Brad Pitt, which circulates in the world, which is very separate from him, over which he has very little control. And that, I think, is kind of increasingly, this idea of publicness, or of all of us being public figures, is increasingly a kind of generalized condition. Um, we hold public figures to account uh, using shame and the rule of law. Uh, which is to say we use kind of free press and democracy to hold public figures to account. Um, but I've never known these institutions to be in such crisis as they are today. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think fascism is really a belief system. Um, I think it's more of a way of being in the world. And I would say that it's it really it's a contempt for others. I mean, fascism is, is shameless uh, in the way that it operates. And therefore, the traditional structures that we use to hold public figures accountable don't seem to be working anymore. I would argue that we've all become public figures uh, to an extent, and maybe this process began with like reality TV shows, uh, which like showed normal people um, and encouraged us to imagine, you know, that famous people could be people just like us. Uh, and in that sense, everyone now has this idea through social media, especially that they are their own kind of PR engine, that they are editing. Uh, their selfies, that they are promoting themselves in specific ways, that they're choosing which images enter the public domain in very specific uh, methods. Um, and of course, if we are public, it's, it's a benefit to those entities that manage that public persona, because if we're public, then we can be sold. And there are fewer constraints over how our data uh, can be used. Um, the Electoral Commission has, has found that the leave uh, .eu campaign broke limitations on spending. And of course, there are very serious causes to think that Brexit is the result of a kind of perverted manipulation uh, of democracy. Um, and in all the early optimism of social media, there was no consideration that not everyone wanted to be turned into content 
because that's in effect what what we have become as public figures is we are content uh, some of us have resisted this by staying off kind of social media or kind of carefully controlling what appears about us online but in a sense the cat has already escaped the bag I think and maybe the most kind of radical thing you could do today would be to deny the existence of the self or to not deny your own self to insist that you have no identity to insist that you have no agency or personality no individuality um, I think a decade ago I would probably have advocated for this, but today I, I don't think I would. And in a sense my kind of conclusion would be to say that the result for me of the condition of the self today has to do with the kind of question of performance and narrative. Um, mainly because since our self in the world is already a fiction, uh, could we not perhaps exaggerate this? Could we not perhaps great, create a greater distance between the fantasy of our public persona uh, and our kind of natural personhood? Because I, I feel that perhaps inside that gap between the two, we might create the ability to kind of cultivate a new form of privacy which is unobserved because it's shielded by a kind of fictional version of ourselves. Uh, and in that sense, I would perhaps conclude by paraphrasing Polonius and simply say, give every man thy voice, but few thy thoughts. Thank you, Jack. Thank you so much, Jack. Um, what we're gonna, I'm gonna bring Adam into this now um, because I think it, it, it sort of follows on seamlessly well uh, and then bring Jack back and we'll have a conversation and also bring you in towards the end. So a, a brief introduction to Adam Telwell. He's the author of three novels, Politics, The Escape, and Lurid and Cute, uh, a, novella, a novella called Kapow, and uh, a project with uh, international uh, novels, in many, many different languages called Multiples, which I, I, I mean, I, re I recommend all his books, but uh, given we have such an international audience here, I think you might find that one particularly interesting. Uh, his work's been translated to 30 language. He's the winner of the E.M. Forster Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters and a Somerset Maugham Award, and has twice been nominated as one of Granter's best young British novelists. He's also the London editor of the Paris Review. Will you please join in welcoming Adam Telwell. So I want to start um, by reading uh, an excerpt from uh, uh, an essay in The Guardian that was published uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, on the 23rd of June. Uh, the writer is called Alex Clark. Um, uh, and this is going to kind of set the scene for, for our conversation. So Alex Clark writes, Suddenly autofiction, which is fictionalized autobiography that does away with traditional elements of the novel, such as plot and character development, is everywhere. Thumping onto your desk in the form of the last volume of, of Karl Ove Knausgaard's epic account of his life, My Struggle, touching more lightly down in the case of Kudos as Rachel Cuss completes her elegant trilogy in which a novelist, Faye, journeys around Europe absorbing the stories strangers and acquaintances tell her, and in Motherhood in which Canadian writer Sheila Hetty dramatizes her own interrogation of what it might mean to choose or not choose choose to have children. These books don't simply use the biographical details of their authors' lives as inspiration, but also to disrupt and complicate our experience of story and subjectivity, to find a new way to describe reality at a time when, as Cathy says in Crudo, quote, it is hard to talk about the truth, end quote, and maybe even harder to write about it. In the perpetual presence of social media, when personal presentation on all the different platforms is everything, these autofictions offer an alternative experimental narrative of self. They are attempts to reshape and repurpose a literary form, and their sudden popularity speaks to the idea that to capture 21st century experience, writers must bro breach borders, blend fiction, memoir, history, poetry, the visual, and performing arts. So what I'd like to, uh, what I'd like to understand better uh, 
is what autofiction claims to be, what it actually is, and what also is the history of literature that's contained in its very long, looming shadow. Um, so Adam, perhaps I, we could start actually at a beginning, uh, a move towards the present. And I wonder whether it would be fair to say that the self is inextric inextricably entwined with the birth of the European novel as we know it uh, in, the, uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries. Yeah, I mean, certainly, like, I was interested in thinking this when Jack was talking about that the individual and democracy are in some way mm -hmm. <coughs> linked, and I think certainly a lot of um, historians of the novel and also novelists themselves would often argue, I think, that the novel is an in, like basically that without the self the novel doesn't, doesn't exist, exist. Um, and at the same time I think this is already complicated though by the kind of Ur novel which for me has always been Don Quixote mm -hmm. by Cervantes and it, I feel like that novel while Jack was talking was kind of reverberating in my head partly because of this idea of what a self actually is and the self image and kind of um, what an author is as well because yep. Cervantes is in the text himself in his own persona, but then says that in fact he's only found this novel that it's a translation from the Arabic. Um, so there is this constant play with identity, which then gets even more complicated on publication. And it's this idea of publication that is quite interesting, where after the first volume, which became a bestseller, there were then many kind of rip-off sequels. Mm -hmm. um, and so in order to counter those, basically it hit Cervantes' brand. Um, he then wrote his own volume two, in which Don Quixote in the novel is aware of all the other novels and is claiming that he's the true Don Quixote and is kind of, he's already been overtaken by his own fictionalization, even though he's already, a, he is only a fiction himself. Um, and that sort of splitting at the heart of the novel seems to be kind of fascinating that from the very first moment, you have, and it seems to me almost that that concern with the self is what marks Cervantes out as the first novelist that you could easily see other texts like, I don't know, Rabelais, kind of Gargantua and Pantagruel is similarly novelistic, but what it lacks is that obsession with something we would call the self. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess, yeah, so there's something interesting to me now in a certain discourse about autofiction, which partly seems, I think, very um, Anglo-centric, because autofiction is certainly not in news and certainly not in many other languages. Um, so when people want to talk about why has it kind of happened now, it seems to me that there might be less of an obvious historical connection in the sense that it's already been there. So that I'm not sure that that kind of social media argument, it seems a little specious to me, actually. And could I just also on the, the sort of, on the notion of the origins of the the English or French speaking novel as, we, as, as we've come to know it. Um, I'd like to get to virtual reality a bit, a bit later, but one of, the, one of the things we've been discussing is, so uh, Jaron Lanier has wrote, uh, his most re recent book is about virtual reality. Um, and he makes the connection, or he attempts to make the connection that one of the things that virtual reality can possibly um, ex excel at is uh, is producing empathy, and then makes the limp link back to again the the, the very origins of, of of the novel as a kind of uh, uh, they're both being empathy machines, and what they do is allow you uh, allow kind of tr uh, 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 a sort of uh, migration of self from you to another self. And, and ultimately a kind of alterity. Uh, and, and this also as a base, basis for a certain um, ideology of politics as well, right? Like how can one really know what it is to be another uh, uh, and one has to leave oneself? And do you say, how do you, what do you think about that connection between, because I know you, you wrote a piece recently about uh, Inaritu's virtual reality um, installation that took place at the Fondazione Prada in Milan. What do you think about this connection between the novel and virtual reality as empathy machines? I can entirely see it. I mean, I think it was one thing I'm trying to think about is we, can you only have empathy for another self? Mm -hmm. Like, could you have empathy for a population or a mm. machine? You know, like, I'm quite interested if one of the crises for the novel right now is what you do with the self in the era of, say, social media and of this constant 
everyday self-presentation. Um, then are there other kind of elements that need to become novelistic subjects? Is the kind of, is the self the only thing the novel can deal with? Um, but then I think what's interesting is outside, either anything smaller than a self or larger than a self is very difficult, I think, for a novel to really comprehend. But I'd be kind of fascinated to see a novel that was an empathy machine for something not a self, mm. and whether that's actually a contradiction in terms, or whether that's possible. Um, and the virtual reality connection, I can, yeah, I mean, in the sense that, what it's about is a confrontation with the other. I mean, in Yuritu's piece was interesting because not only was it an extraordinary experiment in the art of VR, but its actual specific story was in fact a very simple one, very political one, and, and expressly about confrontation with the other. So it's a very simple story about a kind of group of illegal immigrants getting kind of caught by American border control as they try to cross the border. Um, so I think that sense of, of the other is the other kind of, I feel like the novel has always been kind of constantly in dialogue with not just the self, but the other, mm. and how do you include the other? How do you include um, confront sort of dialogue so that that gets back to sort of old fashioned ideas like Bakhtin, the kind of the dialogic novel, which has always seemed to me to be central to the idea of the novel. And it's maybe why I also find something in specific auto fiction now a little thin. Um, like another writer I keep kind of thinking about at the moment is Georges Perec, where one of his projects, you know, he kind of differentiated between different strands of his practice, and one of them he called his autobiographical practice. Um, and it's interesting to me how much, therefore, there again, he explores the self as something that does exist and doesn't exist simultaneously. So he writes his kind of brilliant book, Je me souviens, which takes off from Joe Brainard's book, I remember, but where Brainard's brilliant little book was absolutely specific things that Brainard himself remembered about his own life. Perec did it the other way around, so he only, in Je me souviens, wrote down sentences of things he'd remembered that everyone else of his generation would remember. Mm. Um, and so it was this idea that a self was in fact something communal and shared. Um, and then his greatest kind of work of autobiography was W or The Memory of Childhood. Um, and what interests me there in relation to these kind of modern books is it, it cuts, it basically montages two separate narratives, one of which is an absolutely straight um, autobiographical piece by Perec in the first person, which is about his childhood and the loss of his parents during the Second World War. Um, and the other part is a complete fiction, which is a kind of allegorical story set on this fictional island of W in which sports have become a kind of fascist um, forced kind of maneuver that every person in society has to take part in and which is clearly in some way therefore a comment on the Nazis and on the kind of mid 20th century history but the juxtaposition massively enlarges the narrative and you can't have one without the other and that seems to me a fascinating thing which the novel can do in its dialogic nature which is to expand discourses so you can have more than one thing. And there's something to me almost slightly old fashioned um, in the narrative model that's being offered in some of the kind of more contemporary auto fiction. And, and so just before we, we come up to the present and maybe take apart auto fiction, you know, more, more systematically, I wanted to ask you about meta fiction. Uh, you told me that uh, when you started your, your life or career as a, as a writer, metafiction was very important to you. For those of us who don't know what metafiction was, or indeed continues to be, could you, could you tell us a little bit about metafiction and, and what its relationship was, if any, to the question of the self? Um, yeah, I think that instead, so for me, metafiction is a, simply a, a, any story which has got a story within the story, as it were. Mm. Um, and I guess more specifically, the ones that particularly interest me is when you have it, so I mean, so Cervantes, that's a metafiction. Um, but often it's therefore a story in which the writing of the story is kind of part of the novel's construction. Um, and so you get this as early as, so it's very prevalent in very early fiction like Don Quixote, Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy, where he's constantly, although technically it's not an auto fiction there because the, the eye of the novel is not explicitly Stern's, even though the gap is basically minuscule. Um, it is a constant self-commentary on its own narration at the same time as trying to tell a story. Um, Diderot in France, kind of, so there was this, it then kind of comes back in the 20th century um, 
in writers like Calvino or Kundera, who were the writers I guess I first started reading when I was um, younger. Um, and what interests me in this relation is that there is still a self there, because there is often a narrating self mm. who is the self of the novelist. Um, but the difference is that there the self is put under immense pressure, so that the kind of, it goes back to what Jack was saying of like whether the self is actually an artificial construct, is just simply something that's produced by the act of narrating. Um, and so it seems to me often much more philosophically rich. And one of the things that seems thin, I think, in something which is a straight narrative in the first person is often how little pressure is put on the existence of the self that's narrating. Um, and that that's taken as a given that there is a holistic self that can narrate its own story and its own trials. Um, so I kind of guess one of my counter examples would be someone like Clarice Lispector, the Brazilian novelist, um, who also writes incredibly in the first person, which I guess you could classify as autofiction, some of what she writes, but everything is about kind of abjuring the ordinary form and that also means abjuring the idea of the self. Um, so there's a lovely sentence somewhere where she says coherence is mutilation um, and she's also talking often about um, how she wants to always just sort of destroy the idea of good taste um, and I think that also goes together like one of the things that interests me in sort of the relationship between what the novel can do in sort of the kind of worldwide publication of social media is that social media often occupies a very single tone a kind of flat tone, and it goes back to these ideas of shaming, I think, as well, of the exposure that social media kind of talks about or wants to enact is often actually a very limited form of exposure. The humble brag is basically its mode. Mm. Um, and I think one of the things that's interesting in fiction is how it allows this space precisely through the gap between the eye that narrates and the eye that writes the novel of total exposure, of an exposure that goes, I think, deeper and wilder um, and again, and so like, it seems to me that social media is always hampered by good taste. Um, whereas the novel, especially as someone as brilliant as Lispector practices it, um, is this place of genuine discomfort. Um, so yeah, it's funny like kind of when Jack was talking about the kind of the difference between someone, your name as you speak, and then that I've always found this with novels where I've always enjoyed exploring using an I which is never fully not identified with myself. And then actually reading them in readings is always a slightly discomforting experience because it implicitly embodies that I in me in a way that I actually wouldn't want. Or So it always fascinates me actually how much readings kind of upset me precisely because of, I always want to preserve that gap. Mm -hmm. Flavi, can you turn the fan off? It sounds like the screaming baby in David Lynch's eraser head. <laughs> Oh, did that also turn the screens off? No. Okay, thank you so much. It was driving me nuts. Um, so now on to uh, that, go into a bit more detail on, on specifically autofiction. Um, you, you just used this phrase, uh, and I think indeed Jack sort of alluded to it, which is like the flatness of everyday life, right? So the, the sort of, if the tech, one way of describing the texture of today is a certain kind of flatness, a certain leveling, like you said, the decision to whether or not take an Uber is happening at the same time whether to ask your fiance to marry you, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, um, so is that all, is that the main thing, do you think, that's driving uh, the production, publishing, and consuming of autofiction today? Or do you think there's, I mean, are there other factors at, at play why this is happening, you know, right now? This is a giant question. I, a big I, question. I mean, I think it's always very difficult to give pure sociological analysis for a literary trend or a yeah. kind of, you know, the, clearly, and I think various things are probably converging. I think that there is, in any good writer, there has to be a discomfort and dislike of fiction, basically, huh. that, um, of course, it, uh, you know, you inherit the history of the novel and basically that's full of novels that with their clunky plots and their machinery that doesn't work and, you know, their outdated names or the kind of, I don't, so there's so many different aspects of, I think, what's conventionally seen as a novel um, that obviously you would want to kind of deconstruct, I think, as a young novelist. Um, what I think is odd, I think, and I think 
what's constantly though being referred to as the novel I think in a lot of these essays like the one you were describing is often a kind of parody of the novel mm. and a kind of parody essentially of a 19th century novel and often I think when novels are discussed like this it's as if novels pre-1850 and post about 1920 had never happened mm. um, so that interests me and of I'm sure definitely the sort of this production of the self that's going on I'm sure will have, you know, it definitely influence his writers, you know, the, the writers who are, you know, using this. I think the other interesting thing, though, in these autofictions is if social media is so important, they often don't feature much social media. Mm. Often they're absent in a way that kind of intrigues me, and I think often a more interesting take on this would be, and is, our novels where social media is actively interrogated. Um, so my follow-up to that, then, Adam, would be that and I, Jack, Jack mentioned this, that um, if, if truth has fallen into a kind of permanent free fall uh, of, uh, of absolute relativism, is, is autofiction therefore a claim of authenticity or inauthenticity as the new authenticity? <laughs> I think for, for me it feels like it's making claims to authenticity that authenticity. I find slightly yeah. dated. Huh. Um, and that clearly, I, I don't know, I mean, you know, often they're written, I'm looking at these, they're written by my friends, I can't be reading about these, but, um, but um, I think that what a kind of character is, I mean, I was just reading an interesting essay by a, a French novelist called Tristan Garcia, um, who's written a couple of really brilliant novels, but is also a philosopher. Um, and he wrote a very interesting essay about essentially kind of arguing that the novel was much more religious than it thought, mm. and that where the traditional kind of theory of the novel was, like kind of, we've just been talking about, that it was democratic, based in human rights, the notion of the individual, and therefore purely secular, and they're always anti-theological. He was kind of drawing this really inter interesting analogy between the character, so he was kind of saying, well, what do we mean by a character? And we mean something that is, this, that remains the same in different dramatic situations. Um, that you can't have a character where it's completely unrecognizable of who, what, how Anna Karenina acts in one scene if she's then completely different mm. later on in the novel. Um, and he basically draws an analogy between that and the religious idea of the soul. Mm. Um, and then it argues also quite interestingly about what we think of in terms of judgment, that the novel is often seen as a place where kind of normal moral judgment is suspended. Um, and that's kind of a whole history of the modernist novel would be about that kind of aesthetic appreciation of things that normally are not meant to, you know, like Lolita would be one of the great examples of this, of where the bad reader is told, why are you condemning this book on moral grounds? You know, you should just be kind of, the novel is this space where desire for young children is kind of explored. Um, and then he's basically saying, but actually it's exactly that kind of essence of a thing that is, is which is what in religion would be presented for judgment, mm. the kind of irreducible essence of your soul. Um, so I think that's fascinating me because I was thinking, yeah, there's always this tension in the novel, I think, between thinking of the self as a thing that persists, as it were, that can persist through time, and that that's its irreducible subject, and an idea that the self is just um, something to be played with, that it's, for, you know, that then a whole tradition of the novel where it's about pseudonyms, where it's about um, playing with character and playing with the idea of naming, even. Um, I've forgotten your question now. No, uh, actually, I wanted to ask you, Jack, do you, do you read contemporary fiction at all? Are any of these books meaningful to you? the discourses around them? Um, I'm really the wrong person to ask. I find it very hard to sustain uh, interest in fictional characters. Um, I don't read a lot of fiction. I read, um, I read a piece of fiction which kind of uh, matches a lot of these criteria for the first time in many years a few months ago, which was uh, a piece by Welbeck. But I think it's the map and the territory. Um, but on the whole, the only type of fiction, I mean, I read a lot of fiction in my youth, but most of the fiction that I read as an adult were novels as a way of exploring social ideas. So, I mean, while we were speaking, I was thinking about uh, J.G. Ballard, who, of course, writes novels that have 
<laughs> no real plot and yeah. no real uh, they have no characters uh, they, they have a kind of mood mm. and they explore an idea a kind of they could be cartoons really uh, but they're very elegant cartoons um, yeah I don't really know much about fiction I only really know about the self <laughs> yourself the self the self and um, would you differentiate between it so when you say you don't like fictional characters or don't would fictional characters in, a, in cinema interest you more less equal, um, equally not uh, well the, is there a difference the, yeah there is a difference the, the, the character uh, the self that's portrayed in a uh, in a film one can immediately see that there is a, a, a body which is an inhabited a, a persona and that's basically real life uh, I mean whereas a novel is a singular construction so there's no body that has to interpret that uh, it, it comes already as a kind of finished package in a sense um, yeah that's and, uh, so yeah. one thing I so I wanted to ask you Jack was Adam suggested at the beginning that it would almost be impossible to think of the novel without the self. Yeah. Would the same be true about architecture? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, of course, this is Mark's point that the architecture cannot exist without the architect. And of course, the architect is also an invention of the 19th century and a kind of professional uh, professionalization. Uh, I think that that's largely true. And therefore, you know, architecture by definition requires a kind of self. It requires a kind of ego as well. I think there's no coincidence that Anne Rand chose uh, Howard Rourke in The Fountainhead to be an architect as this kind of personification of pure agency. Um, and dogmatic assertion that you can know yourself. Uh, I take a rather more Taoist view of the self. Uh, I don't think the self exists in any real sense. I don't think it's really a very useful, meaningful philosophical category, except for exploring uh, uh, certain kind of conditions in which people have the But you wouldn't deny that the architect has existed. Well, listen, there's, uh, <laughs> let's... You've let's, just done a book about one of them. Let, let me put it this way, right? Um, uh, the entire world is a fiction and a narrative. All of human engagement is in itself a fiction and a narrative, and therefore autofiction is by nature very akin to reality because that's how reality operates. But as an individual, or let's, let's even go beyond that, as an organism, I, I have a kind of awareness of my surroundings in which I recognize this kind of uh, layers of information which have somehow accumulated over reality to the point where reality is no longer really knowable at all. Uh, you know, the example I would give is maybe you're young, you live at your parents' house, you grow up, maybe you go to university, now you've got to deal with some sort of student accommodation. Now you've got to deal with student fees. Then you get a driver's license. Then you realize you need insurance. Then maybe you get a mortgage. And suddenly you're beginning to deal in highly theoretical conceptual constructs, which are in fact total barriers to uh, any meaningful sense of existence or being. Um, and the self is another one of those types of constructs, uh, which uh, is instrumentalized by other forces, but which I don't think has any objective existence. My response to this, which is, in a sense, a kind of, as I said, let's say, inspired by a sort of Taoist uh, tradition, would be to say that uh, the human world is like a kind of game of chess, right? Uh, and, of course, the seventh seal is my uh, jumping-off point for this. Um, you can choose to play the game of chess. Uh, you can choose to not play the game of chess. Even not playing the game of chess is an acknowledgement of the game of chess. Of course, if you do decide to play the game of chess, you can either play well or you can play badly. I mean, this is basically life, right? So therefore, I have to kind of uh, fake uh, uh, a belief in the self, in individuality, in agency, in identity, uh, in order to be able to perform well at the game of life, uh, which, of course, uh, let's say everyday life is, is constantly being defined through patterns of repetition and through patterns of normalization, which themselves are in flux, but which we somehow view as uh, mysteriously stable. Um, and, and therefore, you know, my, in order to win at life, I have to, I have to go along with a lot of those rules. Uh, but, but that doesn't mean that I choose to acknowledge their existence objectively or think that they're very good. Uh. <laughs> I've got one question before I open it up to you guys. And if you have any questions, put your hand up and we'll get the mic to you. Uh, you mentioned the word organism. Yeah. Uh, and that brings me to Philippe Pareno. 
uh, an artist that Adam has worked with, written about, but also collaborated with. And you you think that there's there's some there are some potentially important. I mean, lessons is a very didactic word, but let's just use it for the moment. There's sort of, well, there are things that the the, fu the future novel could learn or glean or sort of gain from what the kind of thing that Philippe Barreno does. Could you talk about that a little bit? Because I find that really a kind of very interesting. Um, yeah, um, so Philippe, I mean, as everyone can, you know, like he recently did the um, turbine hall installation at, at Tay Modern and kind of um, what he's been doing more and more are works which themselves, I mean, basically, I suppose, in a crude way, he makes films which he then sort of stages. But essentially, more and more as he's kind of progressed, um, the works of art have become incredibly dispersed, so it's difficult to tell really where they begin and end. Um, the shows in which those works of art are kind of produced have also become very disparate, so that they will almost often be indistinguishable from a space, and they're always engaging very much with the space. And in this kind of deconstruction of the work, he's also kind of deconstructed even the idea of, of authorship or creation or the art artist, where, like in the Turbine Hall, it was a kind of the various pieces were being, their kind of um, rhythm and tempo was being organized by an algorithm which itself was being produced by some yeast spores that were growing, um, and it was literally the yeast that was therefore controlling um, the piece. And I've had many conversations with him um, I guess about kind of the role of exactly of the human and of the self yep. in, in art and in fiction. Um, where I guess one of the things I've been really interested in is thinking, well, what, what would this, you know, if you're always wanting to write the most modern novel possible, as it were, um, maybe it could involve, you know, much more intense kind of ideas about the self and about playfulness with the idea of the self. Um, but are there kind of spaces kind of above and below that as well? Um, so could it be that you need to write about astrophysics or can you, like for ages I've been thinking, could you write a novel that would just be the Big Bang, that would like tell the story, you know, how would you make the Big Bang a novel? Um, or on a kind of smaller, you know, would you use microbiology, you know, kind of, are there kind of, so Calvino actually is becoming a writer I'm more and more fascinated by where, um, especially in kind of his cosmic comics, these tiny pieces about, um, essentially which are stories about the universe, um, or basically the stories of the universe, so that there are no selves in these pieces. They are pieces about molecules or um, vast cosmic events. Um, Sorry, Jack? Uh, yeah, of course, I think the, 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 the kind of contemporary equivalent of that would be the field of speculative realism. I don't yeah. know if you've ever read this book. Um, uh, it's, it's, I've forgotten the title, it's by Ian Bogost, it's about alien phenomenology. In fact, maybe it's called Alien <laughs> Phenomenology. It's In a good title, it should yeah. be called. Yeah, I mean, the, the concept of speculative realism is that reality does exist and it can be known, which of course overturns 500 years of Western philosophy, which says that you can't know reality because you're always experiencing it through sensory uh, instruments. Um, and of course, this book is basically breaking down the ontological barriers of things and saying, well, you know, okay, we talk about a grapefruit, but that's an arbitrary distinction because the grapefruit is made up of a skin and made up of uh, many components within it, and therefore there's no need to draw uh, ontological boundaries between a mountain and the terrain that the mountain sits on, and so on and so forth, and at that point, you begin to break down a hierarchy of being, which I think is also very central to what it is you're saying, which is that the human self somehow occupies a privileged position of being within the world. Uh, I mean, I would, I would resist that very much. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting, actually, um, Philippe, one of his projects was actually called Alien Affection, mm. um, which he actually developed with Jaron Lanier, so it kind of comes oh, back to what you're saying. And I remember one of the pieces in that show was um, a sketch that Lanier did where Philippe asked him to come up with a diagram of what an alien camera would look like. Um, and brilliantly, Lanier kind of realized that it would, it would be everywhere, like there would mm. be no need for it to be a single biocular kind of we essentially what we think of as a camera is just a kind of representation of our own eyes of our eye, right. um, and so it's this gorgeous weird gloopy drawing that he basically says this could easily be an alien camera um, and there's something in that that I think would be interesting to apply to the novel as well like yeah. kind of what would a novel look like what would the alien novel look like well I'm, I'm really kind of taken by this idea that the future of the novel is either uh, is at these two extremes of scale 
either the kind of uh, nan nano or the mac macro, right? So, and that the, the, this insistence of the self is an insistence of a kind of mid-range scale, right? Like what we can sense, I mean, a very anthropomorphic, but it's sort of mm. Cobusian modular thing about mm. the world as measured by us, right? Like uh, also at a temporal scale as well. I mean, because yeah. you're also describing, you, you, maybe you have kind of novels which are dynastic, but you very rarely have a novel which exceeds yeah. in a significant way, the yeah. period, unless it's used as a kind of narrative conceit. Or time travel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we are running out of time, but I will open it up to you guys. Any questions or comments? Any? M Mark? Reflections on the score? Well, okay, over there, uh, Olivia. Um, actually, just what you were talking about in terms of uh, anthropomorphic or the kind of scale idea, would you agree or disagree with the idea that the internet is one of the things that has taken us both temporally, physically, etc., outside of the human scale? And that's mm. why, maybe one of the reasons why, if not new, but certainly more popular in the West or in England and America, things like autofiction along with fake news, all of those things where basically we try and fix something onto the human scale to rely on it more because we've lost that, I guess, one-to-one -one ratio in terms of what we can trust in a human way with the system authorship and knowing who wrote it and things kind of relative in that way. Yeah, I think I'm sure that's true. I mean, I'm just thinking, I wonder if there's also a corollary of that which would be the kind of the fiction that could then be written if it did stay on the level of the self because I'm certainly I'm not saying that there should be no more fiction about people. Um, would because the other thing the internet I think has done has made what a boundary between other person. It's it's really complicated that, and it's complicated I think people's feelings in relation to other people. Um, and there's a theorist I really like called Cyan Nagai who wrote a brilliant book called Ugly Feelings, um, which is about a kind of way in which he's kind of saying maybe the new aesthetic categories we should be examining are not kind of the good, the true, and the beautiful, mm. but are the irritating, the cute, the kind of, mm -hmm. these kind of, these sub kind of aesthetic categories, which seems to me really related to what the internet does, where it creates these slightly gruesome feelings that one is maybe ashamed of, or kind of, which are to do with boundaries being overstepped or seeming, you know, a sincerity which turns out to be artificial. So mm. these ideas of, um, and so I kind of also think that maybe that's what fiction could be exploring too, is that gruesomeness a bit more. Yeah, I want to pick up on that. And, and something else which just suddenly kind of came to mind is, of course, uh, the creation of the individual also comes about at the same time in the 19th century that there's the creation of the archetype or the stereotype. And I think a lot of this has to do, I mean, I, I, it's kind of alluded to in um, William Makepeace Thackeray's Paris sketchbook, in which he suggests that it's only the invention of the illustrated newspaper that made the stereotype possible. It's only when people have newspapers which have kind of images in them that they're able to see caricatures of the student, the housewife, the businessman, and so on. And then people start to emulate them. They start to kind of copy the images. They start to model themselves on the stereotypes they see in print. And this kind of process is rapidly accelerated as a result of the proliferation of images through social media. And it's created a kind of homogenization uh, in the sense that you know all interiors increasingly look the same. They're all kind of broadly Airbnb, Pinterest. I was in a New York loft apartment last week and it was just like, I couldn't believe it wasn't a hotel. I couldn't believe that people lived in an interior of this kind. It was so generic and impersonal. But this is what they aspire to. They aspire to the impersonal. And that's also true at the level of physical beauty. I mean, I think the uh, trend towards, uh, you know, a kind of, Kardashian artificiality and a kind of universal skin tone, uh, which is almost airbrushed to the point, but airbrushed in real life. I mean, this is like alt also ultra banal. And in a way, I would be interested in knowing if one were to write a novel, if one were to write the Madame Bovary of today, which is to say one is not writing about a specific person, but one is writing about the kind of archetype uh, and an archetype, you know, who is the kind of ar archetype of social media? Because they're not a single, in the same way that Madame Bovary represents every woman of, uh, of that genre, let's say. I don't know how one would write a novel which was about that figure of 
that Instagram influencer who is not also one person, who has no clear boundaries on themselves, but is in a perpetual feedback loop with an entire system of images. So, yeah, I don't know if you want to work on that maybe, or <laughs> that's maybe <laughs> side project, solo project. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Uh, right at the back, can we get the mic? Right at the back, it's not working, okay. Please shout, shout. your question. Stand up and shout. Hello. Hi. Okay. Um, so my question was like, um, we've spoken a lot about the word self, and if we take it to sort of be like an empty signifier, and that's how we load it up with all these different meanings, which I, like enables it to generate a lot. Okay. So if we take that on board, and then we wanted to destabilize it to like sort of reclaim it in a sense. Um, and you said about bridging the gap between yourself and social media. Mm. I don't understand what you mean. Uh, if you could elaborate. Yeah, sure. N not Thank just you. the gap between y yourself and social media. What I'm really describing is a gap between two types of personhood. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, so uh, Ram Kool has an interesting figure because he's maybe the most famous architect I've ever met in real life and spent enough time with in order to see him in a number of different contexts. And one of the questions that I asked him was, because basically he's constantly performing, right? He's performing as himself. And you can see it very clearly. He cultivates him about himself an air of mystery, because mystery is key to fame, the idea of inaccessibility. He's always busy. He's always uh, unavailable. He's always just about to leave. And this is his kind of persona that he's created around himself in order to be able to deploy Rem Koolhaas as a figure into the world, right? I don't have that relationship with myself. I'm always just a regular guy. Uh, I'm not famous, but I'm also not seeking to create an especial distance between, you know, if I speak publicly, like right now, this is actually what I believe. I'm not in any sense performing, except in the very literal sense that I'm up on, sta on a kind of stage. You don't think that? Well, I mean, you said it yourself, I mean, a regular guy is a kind of fictional guy. It, that's absolutely <laughs> right. Character. That's absolutely right. I mean, you know, you can tell him that the way. You could argue that <clears throat> Rem is actually endeavoring to find something outside the repertoire of a kind of person. Really, yeah. Uh, that he might say, probably fails. I, a but kind of divinity, you know, if you will. If you just said, yeah. As a regular guy, just speaking straightforward. Yeah, that in itself is a kind of Trumpian mechanism. Well, yes, I mean, it's yeah. what people used to call pre-check. Yes, it is. Uh, yes, that's absolutely right. And actually, uh, uh, so this is precisely my point, which that, is... That's why Madame Bovary is an incredibly nice edge. I mean, why it's so astonishing. I mean, having hated cliche all its life, I mean... Flaubert is attempting to address the cliché in a woman who, in a sense, is only a cliché. Mm. Mm. This is a woman, I mean, completely constructed out of cheap fiction. Mm -hmm. which she, you know, uh, and so it seems to me that, that actually Bovary, I mean, it deals with many of the issues. Mm. Mm. Uh, it's not actually particularly about a kind of recent crisis or, you know, a technological consequence of social media or something. It's kind of actually, actually in many ways, at the heart of what the novel is. Mm, yeah. Uh, All I was suggesting... I mean, and to introduce the idea of the self is always already to introduce this problem of mm, Yes. Yeah, and I think the novels, always, I mean, like Bovary, because essentially Bovary is a rewrite of Quixote in the sense that they both have central characters who lose themselves in fictional representations. So Quixote, it's chivalric romances, and for Bovary, it's, um, it's, rom it's kind of pulp novels. Mm. Um, and I think what's interesting in the novel of a form much more than, say, cinema, is that it's always been preoccupied by the idea of representation, so that it includes essentially people reading nearly are always kind of, and so now it would be a character kind of, as it were, on social media would be, I think, actually an archetypal character. Perhaps the question is, what happens to everyone's literary life when everyone 
I mean, it's yeah. it's more about stopping do, or doing other things. Mm-hmm. I, I think the last point I want to make. I mean, it's. I think that there's a great view of my bitch in thinking about the name, but in a sense, the force of it is most people actually seem really fairly comfortable with their name. I think there's a small percentage when you talk to them at school who actually don't like their names. Mm. They're a fairly catastrophic population. <laughs> the ones who say to them, they actually think it was rather clever of their parents to give them the right name. Because, you know, although of course it was arbitrary, once it's been given, it stops being arbitrary. Mm. And it's the thing around which everything kind of clings to. So people have a sense that humanists often say, you know, your name is so wonderful, wouldn't it be awful if we were all kind of called it numbers? No, it would be exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember this because at school we were first called numbers. And UK went through exactly the same thing. They'd be quite clever to call me. I was called Prepty 41. <laughs> that kind of sounds right. <laughs> Thank goodness I wasn't Prepty 40. <laughs> and I remember doing a lecture here. And I said I was in the larger school called Mayday 14. And I thought, you know, I'm so lucky not to be called Mayday 15. Mm. It just didn't go right. Man came up after the lecture and said, Actually, I was my name 15. <laughs> <laughs> so that, you know, but at this point, uh, it seems to me you have to kind of study the effects of nomination. I mean, it's, it's such a powerful thing. My suggestion more related to the possibility of being and perhaps the possibility of knowing something about reality. The example I w- No, you don't look happy about that. No. All right. Well, none, 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 nonetheless, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude the argument very rapidly, which is I'm never more at home and at peace than A, when I'm in silence. And I also, also find that when uh, pet owners speak to their dogs, it's the most ridiculous thing because if you want to have any empathy or compassion with another animal, you don't want to talk to it. You need to be there in silence together. That's how you establish real communication. But I'm never more at peace than when I'm floating on my back in the sea looking at the horizon. This idea of a horizon which has existed on the earth for many billions of years and will exist a long time after I'm gone. And therefore, uh, during that moment, one has a sense of being of being in the world, which is impossible as soon as one begins to speak or construct a self. Or a ma- And so basically all I was advocating or perhaps suggesting is that, at least for me, the more I play the game with the fiction of the self, the more I indulge in the kind of absurdity and possibilities of that as a type of game, the more I try to create a distance between that and the two weeks a year when I spend my time floating on my back in the sea. Uh, I just remind you that our last uh, cell format is this Friday, same time, same place. Uh, We have Olivia Sujic and Brendan McKetrick. Uh, I really hope you can join us. Um, Thank you so much for being here. Please join me in thanking uh, Jack Self and Adam Thurwell. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.